Alors, bonjour et merci d'être parmi nous ce midi. Mon nom est Suzanne Sauvage, je suis la présidente et chef de la direction du Musée McCord et je suis très heureuse aujourd'hui de vous accueillir au vernissage de l'exposition « Il fut un chant », une exposition de l'artiste Meryl McMaster qui sera ouverte au public dès demain et ça jusqu'au 15 août. Avant toute chose, je voudrais d'abord vous rappeler que le Musée McCord est situé sur un territoire non cédé par voie de traité et qu'un territoire qui est fréquenté et occupé depuis des millénaires par les communautés autochtones. Et je voudrais aussi souligner que la nation ghanienne Geaga démontre toujours un fort attachement envers ce territoire qu'elle nomme Tiotiagé. The McCord Museum acknowledges its colonial past and its devastating consequences on First Peoples. Therefore, we believe that it is our duty to help raise awareness of and revitalize indigenous cultures. And this exhibition this morning of Meryl McMaster is, is one, I think, among many wonderful examples of the revitalization of indigenous cultures, and we're very happy to present it. Juste un mot pour vous dire que l'événement ce matin va, être, va se dérouler en français et en anglais et il sera suivi d'une période de questions. J'ai maintenant le plaisir euh, de vous présenter nos intervenants. First of all, I'd like to introduce Meryl McMaster. Hello, Meryl. Meryl is in Gatineau, in her home, and we're happy to have her with us this morning. Uh, on a aussi uh, Hélène Sanson, who's a curator of photography And she is at the McCord Museum, luckier in our gallery with the exhibition. Guylaine, I guess, is at home. <laughs> She's our curator of material culture. And uh, Pierre-François Ouellet, qui est le fondateur et directeur de la galerie Pierre-François Ouellet Art Contemporain, une galerie qui, a, qui existe à Montréal et à Toronto, et qui est d'ailleurs le galeriste de Muriel McMaster à Montréal. Alors, bienvenue à tout le monde. Et Pierre-François va être l'animateur euh, de nos échanges. Alors, je lui laisse la parole. Bonjour, welcome. Meryl, I'm very honored uh, to be here with uh, you virtually. Et Suzanne, merci beaucoup de l'invitation. Uh, well, uh, be spending 30, 35 minutes uh, with, question, uh, with questions for the panelists, and then we'll open up to the public for another 10 minutes. Alors, juste le déroulement de ce vernissage, eh bien, on va poser quelques questions aux panélistes, et ensuite, on, on va ouvrir la séance de questions à l'ensemble des gens qui nous suivent sur Internet. Alors voilà, merci à tous. Suzanne, j'ai pour toi une admiration extraordinaire pour tout ce que fait le, le McCord et entre autres ce merveilleux programme de résidence d'artistes. Pourquoi est-ce que le musée fait-il des résidences avec des artistes? Ben écoute, euh, je, je pensais que tu allais me poser cette question-là et puis j'ai vérifié depuis combien de temps ce programme existe et j'ai été étonnée parce que c'est presque dix ans. On a, on a mis en place ce programme d'artistes en résidence en 2012 et puis l'objectif était très simple, c'était celui d'inviter des artistes contemporains à s'intéresser à nos collections, qui sont des, des collections euh, essentiellement coloniales et à les réinterpréter et à vraiment y apporter... Euh, euh, un point de vue plus critique et, et plus actuel, si tu veux. Alors, euh, je dois dire que notre choix euh, au cours des dernières années s'est beaucoup porté sur des artistes autochtones. Je pense que tu connais d'ailleurs. Je pense à Nadia Amir, je pense à Anna Glass, euh, Kent Monkman et, et d'autres. Et à chaque fois, euh, on leur demande un peu le même devoir, c'est de réfléchir aux liens qui existent entre leurs pratiques artistiques nos artefacts et aussi les histoires euh, qu'ils trouvent en faisant la recherche à travers dans, dans nos collections, dans le cadre de leur, euh, de leur résidence. Et je pense que les histoires qu'ils découvrent est vraiment le facteur créatif, si tu veux, pour euh, l'œuvre qu'ils créent à la fin de, ce, de cette euh, résidence euh, dans le cadre d'une exposition comme celle qu'on va voir euh, aujourd'hui. Et à chaque fois, on est euh, étonné et ravi euh, de... De, de voir l'interprétation qui est toujours, toujours discursive, et c'est ce qu'on demande finalement à l'origine. Et, euh, et puis, je pense qu'on va voir ce matin aussi que Meryl ne nous décevra pas parce qu'elle est allée exactement dans cette direction-là aussi. Alors, voilà un petit peu pourquoi on fait cette, ces résidences d'artistes. Et ça doit être très plaisant pour un artiste parce que vous avez une collection encyclopédique qui va toucher à la 
à tellement de sujets et de sujets qu'on peut revisiter. Et la question que je me posais, c'est « Why, as the McCourt selected in particular, Meryl McMaster for this residency program? » I must admit that uh, I, uh, it's, it was initially a personal choice because I, I discovered uh, Meryl's work at La Foire Papier. If you remember Pierre-François, about three years ago or something like that, you, had, uh, you were showing a, a black and white uh, self-portrait of uh, Meryl there. I think it was part of a series of work she did long time ago. And I was so moved and so impressed and then and even more impressed when you, you shared other work uh, with me that I thought, oh, this, this artist should really be part of our artists in residence program. And I thought, you know, very naively that she would be working with our photography collection. <laughs> Little did I know she didn't <laughs> at all work with that guy with that collection and that's a very good thing. So I was very enthusiastic about her and uh, moved by her work and I came back at the museum and share my uh, my discovery basically with uh, Guylaine and Hélène and uh, we start talking about Meryl and I think all of us agreed that she would be a great candidate and we were lucky that despite all her engagements she agreed to be a, an artist in residence at the McCord Museum. So thank you Meryl. You're touching uh, on a very particular series because if I, and Meryl, you can correct me, uh, the second self uh, uh, project was actually done when you were still in school. And uh, you actually, so at Bocad University uh, at the time, and you actually got your first museum show with that series at the National Museum of the American Indian. Am I correct? Uh, well, one of my first, one of my first, yeah, yeah. So, so it's, that was a very exciting opportunity, yeah. So it's quite interesting to see how your work has evolved because uh, as people might know, you just had a very important show uh, as immense as the side that uh, traveled and that really related to your uh, relationship also about nature and locations. I wanted to address a question because sadly enough, but you'll have lots of time, Meryl, you'll be the last person I have questions for. Mais, uh, je vais parler plutôt aux gens qui ont appuyé Meryl et qui ont uh, permis cette réalisation. Alors, je voudrais pas demander à Hélène parce que, uh, à la surprise de Suzanne, uh, donc Meryl n'a pas travaillé en photographie, dans les collections de photographie comme telles. Mais, C'est à toi comme conservatrice que revient la première euh, des collections de photos qui revient la première question, à savoir, est-ce que tu peux nous expliquer euh, brièvement euh, les thèmes et les, cette exposition que Meryl a fait et qui s'intitule en français « Il fut un chant ». Oui, oui, euh, bonjour à tous et bonjour Pierre-François. Euh, oui, c'est un plaisir pour moi de me trouver en plus dans la salle euh, de l'exposition. Je peux être... Euh, Je, 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 je ressens l'émotion des pièces qui sont dans cette salle-là. Et comme euh, euh, vous le disiez, on aurait pu s'attendre à une exposition de photographie, mais non, euh, Meryl a choisi des objets de la collection euh, de culture matérielle qui sont des cloches de verre euh, sous lesquelles sont euh, protégés et conservés, naturalisés des oiseaux empaillés et des végétaux. Euh, Guylaine vous en parlera probablement euh, plus tard, mais à partir de ces, euh, de ces pièces de la collection, Meryl a créé une installation dans laquelle il y a plusieurs, euh, euh, deux sculptures et une photographie. Et l'exposition pour le visiteur, si je devais la décrire, elle, se, elle est, euh, se compose en fait de quatre stations. Quand on entre dans la salle, il y a d'abord un, une ambiance sonore, on, en, on est comme dans un boisé, Et on entend le chant des oiseaux et de temps à autre, il y a les cris du corbeau, le cri rauque du corbeau qui apparaît, qui est comme une alerte. Et euh, euh, on voit d'abord les pièces de la collection, trois magnifiques pièces de la collection. C'est euh, le cloche de verre euh, euh, où sont naturalisés des oiseaux magnifiques. Ensuite, on a une deuxième pièce qui est comme un socle lumineux. Euh, au centre duquel se trouve un oiseau mort. C'est un étourneau, un étourneau comme euh, on en voit souvent dans les œuvres de Merrill. C'est un, euh, un de ses compagnons, je dirais. Et euh, euh, autour de cet oiseau mort, il y a une projection vidéo qui nous montre une, euh, une, des nuées d'oiseaux dans le ciel, mais très haut, et qui se déplacent. Alors, il y a comme un mouvement perpétuel autour de cet oiseau. C'est une œuvre qui est très poétique, qui est très... Euh, 
qui a comme une dimension spirituelle. J'en parlerai peut-être plus tard, euh, dans quelques minutes. La deuxième pièce, deuxième, la, qui serait la troisième station, est une sculpture en forme de cloche de verre, mais euh, complètement recouverte, une cloche de verre qui serait recouverte de pièces de métal euh, qui reflètent à la fois la lumière et puis qui reflètent aussi notre propre image, mais l'image du spectateur, mais complètement morcelée. Et euh, c'est très confrontant comme pièce, c'est massif, c'est un peu au-dessus de, de, de nous. Et cette pièce est surmontée d'un magnifique corbeau, encore là un, une figure récurrente dans son travail. Euh, le corbeau qui a les ailes déployées, qui a deux têtes, et dans l'une, une de ses têtes tient une petite cloche dans son bec. Euh, alors, c'est des éléments symboliques, toute la... Toute la les œuvres de Merrill sont comme ça chargées de, 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 de détails qui ont une très euh, grande force poétique et, et symbolique et qui nous lancent dans l'imaginaire. La quatrième station est une photographie, mais encore là, la photographie est nouvelle. Elle ne nous a pas habitués à cette forme-là. C'est la forme du ton de l'eau, la forme ronde qui constitue, compose en fait un, un univers euh, clos. Et tout dans cette photographie est est artificielle, a été construite. Il y a, on y voit une personne, euh, on reconnaît Meryl, mais euh, on est habitué à, à, à ses autoportraits, euh, qui, est, qui se repose après avoir travaillé. Elle est appuyée sur un, un empilage de feuilles et de végétaux euh, qui me suggère un herbier, un immense herbier. Et derrière elle, il y a un, un, un univers, un, un fond bleu euh, qui rappelle euh, les, euh, les cyanotypes du début de la photographie, qui était aussi une, une technique pour euh, enregistrer ou euh, garder la trace des végétaux. Alors voilà, ça c'est les, euh, les quatre stations de cette magnifique installation. Hélène, c'est vraiment très excitant de voir ces images et de t'entendre les décrire. Au-delà du virtuel, bien sûr, il va falloir en faire l'expérience physiquement. Ah oui. Alors, donc, on a très, très hâte de voir ça. D'autant plus que c'est un moment assez exceptionnel dans la carrière de Merrill, parce que c'est la première fois que Merrill présente de la sculpture et de la vidéo. So congratulations, Meryl. We're all very excited to see how you're going to, well, how you've explored this uh, new medium for you and how you're going to continue exploring them. So I can't wait uh, to have uh, the chance to go and see the exhibition. Alors, au-delà de ces magnifiques descriptions que tu m'as faites, uh, il y a une symbolique qui, ou des symboliques qui sont apparentes. Est-ce que tu peux nous parler, Hélène, des grands thèmes de, qui sont sous-jacents à cette exposition? Oui, avec plaisir, parce que c'est très, très riche de ce point de vue. Euh, D'abord, il y a le titre de l'exposition, hein, « Il fut un chant, There once was a song », qui nous suggère tout de suite une note nostalgique, quelque chose qu'on aurait trouvé, quelque chose qui est révolu. Mais les autres pièces de l'expo sont vraiment plutôt tournées vers l'espoir, vers l'avenir, vers euh, euh, ce qui peut advenir d'une réflexion euh, de, 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 de bien qui peut être apporté dans le futur. Euh, Au-delà du thème de la nostalgie, à partir de, de, du motif des oiseaux, euh, Meryl va nous faire réfléchir sur le thème de, de la mort, de la présence de la mort comme un phénomène naturel de la vie. Euh, alors que dans les cloches de verre, on veut simuler la vie, on prend des oiseaux artificiels des, et on veut simuler la vie. Elle, avec le grand, le, la, la, la table basse où on voit ce, cette espèce d'hôtel à un oiseau mort, c'est une réflexion sur la, la, le phénomène naturel de la mort, de la perte, de la destruction, de la décomposition, mais qui est nécessaire pour permettre la renaissance, pour qu'un nouveau champ advienne. Ensuite, il y a aussi le thème à travers la sculpture, l'anti-cloche la, de verre, comme Meryl l'appelle. Euh, C'est une, une, un questionnement sur notre rapport à la nature. Euh, il y a lieu de, de déconstruire quelque chose, de réfléchir de, de, à, à notre rapport hégémonique avec la nature et puis à reconstruire quelque chose de nouveau. Cette pièce-là nous met vraiment entre le, la destruction et la renaissance, la reconstruction. Et puis, il y a ce, ce symbole de la, du, du corbeau qui, lui, est un symbole de l'espérance, d'un messager 
qui peut annoncer quelque chose de, de, de nouveau, de, 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 de retrouver peut-être ce champ perdu. Et dans la, la photographie, euh, euh, moi, j'y vois un, un, un moment de pause. Hein, le, le titre, c'est « Lorsque la tempête cessera, je reprendrai mon travail ». C'est comme s'il y avait un, un moment de pause pour réfléchir. Euh, la, la, le visage est très songeur et les éléments de, symboliques de cette image-là se réfèrent beaucoup à la science. Euh, L'herbier, euh, la, la façon d'enregistrer de, les photographies, les, les, euh, les objets euh, de la nature euh, au 19e siècle, c'est qui est encore en relation avec les cloches de verre. Hein. Les cloches de verre sont du 19e et là, dans cette photographie-là, il y a cette référence aussi à des premières méthodes scientifiques. Et euh, il y a aussi d'autres éléments très symboliques et universels qui sont, qui sont la, la chandelle, la chandelle allumée, la chandelle éteinte, la plume. Alors, euh, euh, voilà, c'est quelques-uns des thèmes que je lance comme ça et que je pense que chacun peut vraiment approfondir euh, et se laisser toucher par ces pièces-là qui sont envoûtantes. Quelle belle richesse euh, euh, de thèmes et d'idées qu'il va falloir aller explorer. Alors, oui. Uh, merci beaucoup, Hélène. Uh, Meryl, thank you so much for these works that seem already so inspiring, even virtually. Uh, so thank you. And I was curious to know, what inspired you, uh, Meryl, in the making of this exhibition? And could you tell us about your creative process? Yes, for sure. Um, well, first off, I just want to say hi, everyone who's uh, tuning in. Um, this is a different experience for an opening that I've done before. So a unique opportunity to actually speak to probably a lot more people than usually. Um, and, and then I also just really want to quickly say thank you to the McCord Museum and especially to, to, to Suzanne uh, for um, choosing me to be an artist in residence and for supporting this project. Um, I also want to thank Helen and Dylan for touring me around uh, the collection. Uh, it was a really interesting, um, yeah, couple of months um, looking through the collection. Um, And then also the rest of the staff who also helped, um, you know, with everything with the project. It was just a really wonderful experience. And uh, and then I just want to also acknowledge uh, the support of the Ontario Arts Council also for this project and Pierre Francois for moderating. So there, um, my quick housekeeping of things. But uh, um, so we'll get to your question. So um, when I uh, yeah when I first uh, toured the collection back in um, in the winter of 2019. Um, yeah, it was quite overwhelming. There was lots of um, um, different, uh, um, you know, collections that I was given access to, um, online databases, and so there was um, lots of lots of really interesting things. And at first, it was kind of, you know, being new to this experience um, uh, of uh, being an artist in residence at a museum. Um, it definitely, I, my mind was going in all sorts of directions. Um, Uh, so it was it was hard to narrow down, but um, eventually I kind of settled on some objects that grabbed my attention, which is um, what have been mentioned are these bell jars um, uh, that that I saw. And there was four. Um, there's only three in the exhibition that are being showed, but there was uh, four that I was interested in. Um, three that were in the form of a bell and there was one that was quite a large um, kind of glass cabinet um, that um, what I was told uses as a fire screen um, which was kind of interesting um, use um, and uh, yeah within held kind of within these objects were um, these scenes of exotic birds that um, you know usually would never um, Uh, be in the same habitat as one another. Um, so there was these kind of exotic birds and butterflies uh, kind of suspended in mid-flight and um, insects uh, and also plant material. And uh, yeah, I was taken with the idea that these objects uh, represent, you know, our kind of our strong desires to hold on to the past and, and to attempt to control um, nature. And as I was kind of, you know, kind of thinking more about them, I, I felt like they kind of represented to me this kind of deep fear that we all share that we will kind of lose our connection to history and, and, and to our past. And so kind of like reflecting on, on those thoughts, I was inspired to create these three works. Um, 
in the exhibition that kind of make observations of the correlations between life and death, um, growth and decay, which, you know, are conditions that are shared by all uh, living things. And my process this time around was um, a bit different. Um, I, uh, I mean, I, I was able to visit the museum several times, um, but then uh, the pandemic hit um, kind of soon after I started the residency and I also had a little baby. So um, my usual kind of starting points for um, uh, kind of being inspired um, looked a bit different as I wasn't really able to kind of go out and do my usual kind of just exploring different materials and and um, yeah so that that changed my process so um, so it was yeah a lot more kind of um, uh, uh, online research and then kind of continuing looking at objects and stuff um, uh, and, uh, yeah, looking at materials online different ways or using, in a sense, using, uh, what was up, using up what was in my studio, um, uh, as well. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, so, so, um, but usually I start with, with a lot of my processes with doing sketches. So once I'm kind of looking at things and, and um, uh, I have some ideas, beginning steps. Uh, I do lots of sketches. Um, I also do lots of mind maps to see um, where my ideas are kind of leading. Um, uh, so, um, and then, yeah, and then kind of once I have those under my belt, those lots of sketches and ideas, then, then it's kind of where I'm looking at materials, gathering them and um, starting, starting to build. Um, uh, so, um, for this exhibition also, I wanted to, cause it was smaller, I wanted to, um, kind of focus on experimenting, um, on making a video installation, uh, as well as, um, a sculptural work that would be a standalone piece, um, in the exhibition space, as opposed to being used in one of my photographs. Um, if people who are familiar with, um, some of my, well, older and recent work, um, uh, I usually, you know, build lots of different, um, uh, well, yeah, sculptural elements or props um, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, I'm holding or, or yeah, it's attached to me and my body in some way um, uh, within, within the photograph. So they they become also part of kind of the subject also of the photograph with me. Um, so anyway, so I wanted to, um, with this exhibition, um, yeah, include something that was different that was into one of my photographs um, that told its story on its own and didn't need, um, yeah, me maybe as um, also the, the kind of the ignition of the, um, that the story, I guess. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, and I also with this uh, um, started working with some new uh, people and um, kind of trade people in different trades to um, uh, uh, um, make some of the different elements. So I worked with um, a welder, Mike Mulligan, who uh, helped make the base for the sculptural element in the exhibition. Um, and uh, that was that was fun to kind of um, collaborate with him because originally I was do it how I normally do it, which is making something out of wire or cardboard or something um, like that. Something that you know uh, I usually use, um, but I needed for this it to be more sturdy and, and kind of hold it together more than just the time I'm photographing something. So um, so I worked with him um, to create the base. You don't actually see you don't really see it when you see the sculptural piece. It's hidden by um, the different elements that I've kind of covered up with. But uh, anyways, I worked with him. Um, I also worked with a taxidermist, uh, Kevin Hockley, um, who helped um, put together the different birds that are um, uh, on the sculpture and then um, on, in and around the video projection, this little bird. And then, and then I also worked with my husband, Ian, um, to do the uh, video, video rendering um, the video projections. So, um, yeah, so that was, you know, that was fun, you know, to kind of 
uh, uh, work with those people. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, the first, uh, as Pierre Francois was saying, um, uh, this is the first time I've um, uh, produced a video piece for an exhibition. Um, and this particular one I titled uh, for the song that is to follow. And um, when you go into the gallery space, um, you will see it's projected on quite, quite this large base. Um, and it's a uh, murmuration of thousands of uh, um, little birds, little starlings that are kind of flocking around um, this dead uh, or lifeless starling uh, that's in the middle of the, the platform. And uh, a lot of times in my work, I use birds as um, kind of symbols of a messenger or, or a guide. Um, and uh, here um, you kind of see this digital murmuration almost kind of um, floating around this um, once kind of living starling almost in kind of mourning, I, I see it. Um, also with this, with this video piece, I was thinking of wanting to link uh, the digital and the real um, in, in now kind of a familiar um, reversal, um, kind of the living as dead and, and the non-living um, as alive. So, um, so that's what some things I was kind of inspired by and thinking of with that work. Um, the sculptural piece um, titled The Feather That Tomorrow Will Form um, is uh, bringing the, the, the shape of the bell jar um, into the exhibition. And uh, it's this kind of um, scaled reflective uh, object that I've created. Um, all the different elements that are, um, I've attached to the outside are um, in, in, in shapes of shards, a mirror, and um, they, they're made actually out of, cut out of um, a similar material to plexi, um, uh, the plastic, and, uh, and then I did a mirroring process um, on top of that. So, um, so when you walk around the object, um, they're mounted at different angles. So sometimes you might see, um, you know, glimpses of yourself or, or the room or your surroundings. Um, but it's in this midst of um, kind of a transformative process. It's, it's breaking and kind of rebuilding. And um, again, as you kind of, the only sound really that you're going to hear in the exhibition is coming from within this uh, um, in, within the sculpture and its sounds of uh, the forest, uh, forest sounds mixed with uh, kind of warning calls um, uh, of the crow that's perched on top. Um, and, you know, this kind of anti-bell jar um, is kind of protecting um, what is within um, while also kind of distracting us away um, with its kind of mirrored surface. Um, and, uh, uh, and then for, yeah, as for most of you who are familiar with my work, I'm, I work mainly in photography. Um, and so uh, the photograph in the exhibition is maybe the most familiar maybe to, um, to my work. Um, uh, uh, it is a self-portrait, which I've been doing for many years. Um, it's a large circular photograph and I titled it, uh, When the Storm Ends, I'll Finish My Work. And it kind of shows um, this tired character who, who's been working, you know, really hard um, at maybe recording something that is important to her. Um, you know, I leave that a lot up to the viewer of maybe what you think that might be. You know, sometimes I can see it as maybe, you know, I'm recording kind of the natural history of the world. You know, but again, it's um, I like to leave some some stuff up to what the viewer kind of how how you go down your own kind of journey with my images. Um, but, uh, but yeah, she's resting kind of under this canopy, um, uh, which uh, uh, is made out of a sander type, which I did. Um, so again, that's, that was kind of a new process um, in, one of, in my images. I'd done sander types before when I was younger, sun prints in, in camp, um, but I'd never actually done like a really large scale um, sander type. So, uh, uh, so that took a lot of, a great deal of, um, learning about, you know, relearning and experimenting. Um, I did it in my house in a controlled environment. Um, and it was a lot of playing with light sources, um, exposure times. It was quite a long exposure. Um, it was something that I set up at night and then, you know, 
uh, got up in the morning and, and kind of like Christmas day, you know, wanting to go see what, it, how it worked out, what happened and wash it. And so, um, uh, so that was a kind of interesting process and also playing with the pH of the water to kind of get, mm. um, uh, the right, uh, you know, kind of coloring as well, that kind of deep blue. Um, but yeah, I kind of created, and then, uh, this kind of natural shelter around me, it's all collected plants from, um, around that, my house. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the sanotype, its early uses was for blueprints. So to me, it kind of introduces, uh, and represents kind of, um, industrialization, um, and that kind of loss of our connection with nature, uh, into the exhibition as well. So, Anyway, they're probably taking up my five minutes, so um, uh, or however long we get. But um, that's kind of a, a bit about the um, a bit about the process and my inspirations. I hope so. Carol, it's really fascinating. Uh, first of all, I've never done something like this, I mean, making a vernissage of a, in this way, and also seeing the questions arriving. Oh, there's the questions. Okay. <laughs> I didn't see. <laughs> A, a number of them. Les questions ont été posées en, en, en français, donc on va pouvoir y revenir. Mais uh, Meryl, merci d'avoir expliqué les processus des différentes œuvres. What strikes me uh, in your process is that you were actually consciously or unconsciously inspired also by 19th century technology, because when you're talking about cyanotype, it's something that is coming also from forgotten past from the uh, 19th century. And even like the, uh, the references that you're doing of capturing uh, the animals, uh, in a sense for me also, it, the sound that you take or the, from the starling, you're, it's like encapsul encapsulating it in a technology that's of today instead of bell jars. I'm curious to know about uh, these, uh, and that's a personal question, why all? Uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm curious to know, did you tape at the Sterlings? Uh, so, so are you talking about the sound or the, yeah. the video? Yes, the sound. Oh, of the the sound. So, the, so, um, so the sound that's in the bell jar, no, so it's, um, so it's, you know, kind of rural, I online, you know, found um, royalty free um, sounds. So, but it's edited um, uh, with several different other sounds um, that, uh, that I gathered. So, um, so yeah, so sounds of the forest and other little birds. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then introducing the, this kind of more ominous sounding um, sound of the, the crow. Um, so, uh, yeah, but yeah, I wish, well, I mean, I think it, I, that would have been a very interesting, um, you know, maybe exploring further uh, in other projects, potentially recording my own sound, but uh, just with the little baby, um, it was really hard to um, get much done in like, you know, the half hour, hour she naps. So, you know, um, and at the time I lived more in the city. So, um, but yes, so no, I didn't there, I didn't personally record them. So, yeah. Well, this is a great, you know, like even in the times of pandemic and uh, also the joy of motherhood though, you were able to explore many new venues. And I, I was thinking video, I was thinking uh, sculpture, but also sound-based work. So, <laughs> felicitations. Uh, and this motif that is coming all the time of the uh, bell jar, J'aurais une question pour Guylaine, qui est la uh, conservatrice de la culture matérielle au, au Musée McCord. Uh, this, uh, don't go away, Meryl, because we have lots of questions for you after. <laughs> I'm going to go nap now. <laughs> <laughs> so, Guylaine, uh, les cloches de verre sont omniprésentes dans l'exposition. Bell jars are ubiquitous in this exhibition. What were their usage? And, what do they mean symbolically? Um, so hello everyone. Um, well, the bell jars, which are actually known as, um, they're better known as parlor domes or sometimes they're called parlor shades because of where they were usually used uh, in the household. Um, and in the 19th century, they became highly popularized objects in 
I have to say, well-to-do household. Not everybody could afford these um, during the Victorian era. So we're talking about 1837 to 1901. And in their simpl in simplest form, they're just basically a glass dome with a wooden base. And they were used to display precious objects of uh, different types. I mean, we have some in the collections that protect clocks and some protect uh, um, bouquets, like wedding bouquets. Um, and so they were used to protect objects from dust or I would get, I would say, you know, little fingers or bigger fingers. Um, and um, so the domes, the domes themselves fundamentally are just display cases, but what they protected said a lot about the people uh, who owned them and also the, the times they lived in. And so you kind of have to put yourself in the 19th century where the home is more than just uh, a space to live in. Uh, it says a lot about the family uh, itself. And so the objects and the house um, are important, but they're also accepted ways of communicating social status. And the parlor, which uh, is, is basically the center of the family uh, life, is when you look at pictures from that period, 19th century, it's cluttered and it's and, and there's these eclectic pieces of furniture of objects uh, um, and you know it's heavy, it's it's uh, it's quite impressive actually, <laughs> um, and it's a sort of sanctuary for um, for the souvenirs and experiences um, and. Um, they're a reflection basically of the owner's cultural beliefs and opinions. And they're, they're a way to show um, the, the owner's refined taste, of course, um, education, uh, social position, and their understanding of the outside world. And again, if you contextualize the 19th century, it's a time where the, you see a rapid growth of cities and it's the birth of the industrial revolution both of which favored progress over the natural world. And, but it's also an era where it, that is characterized by, by uh, scientific exploration and discoveries. You can think of Charles Darwin uh, and, the and the theory of evolution and his contemporaries. So nature becomes a hot topic and natural history part of the Victorian rage. And incidentally, uh, taxidermy is at its peak at this time uh, because you want to bring back specimens of animals and birds and whatever you've discovered. Um, and so the domes that you see in this collection are, you know, there's co colorful exotic birds. Don't ask me what birds, I have no clue. I know that hummingbirds were very, uh, were very uh, favored. You know, had to be birds that are very colorful. Um, and um, they, they're basically a manifestation of this exploitation of these discoveries. Uh, nature is brought into the home where it is going to be displayed but more importantly, where it's controlled. So the birds are not static. You can see them, they're flying, they, they look alive and they're within their natural environment. So they have plants and they have branches and things like that. Um, and uh, while a bit eerie, I mean, I don't particularly like this type of uh, taxidermy uh, bells, um, they, they're basically, you're bringing the natural world into the domestic sphere but you're containing it within an art form and it becomes a fad in the 19th century. Um, and so, and it's not only birds, you could have small animal, animals, insects, butterflies, uh, and there's some in some of the uh, bells that we see in the exhibition, but it went even beyond that because you would have these uh, three dimensional nature morte um, compositions made from natural materials. So you would have things like uh, uh, bouquets of flowers made with seashells or beeswax or hair or, or wool. And um, it's that, e that idea of nature that you're containing, that you're controlling, it never fades, never dies. And you're basically, it's, you're civilizing nature by bringing into the home. And so um, the parlor, which is, like I said, the central, but it's also the place where you would, you would greet your guests and it was meant to impress people. And so women, Victorian women, become the agents. They, they're the builders of this, this domestic family image. 
through their decor, through their refined taste, or if you, if you like it, um, they are basically, they have to reflect and they have to enhance their husbands and their families' uh, status. And in that context, nature will play a important symbolic role in that image. And so that's basically, you know, in a, a very short description, what these bells are about. Elena. Uh, Meryl mentioned that uh, there were four bells that she got inspired, but can you tell us, do you have many more and how do they situate within the Montreal experience of the 19th century? We, it's, it, we have four bells with animals, in this case birds, uh, as, um, as uh, Meryl was saying. So there's three which are domes and there's one that's a fire screen. So you would have put that in front of your fireplace and it's, it's composition of these uh, numerous creatures within it. There's other bells, like I said, in the collections, but that are not uh, taxidermy related. So we have some with compositions made of hair uh, so it's bouquets of flowers made of hair. We have some that are um, um, made of seashells, uh, these bouquets made of seashells. Other domes are used, like I said, to protect clocks or to protect wedding bouquets. Or So there are a few in the collection. And of course, it would have been the type of objects that you would have found in uh, in a Montreal home at, in, in, at the Victorian period. It was part of that... Um, of the taste of the time. So the emphasis uh, within this show are about the ones that are related to nature and taxidermy. So in that uh, line of uh, interrogation, I would be curious, Meryl, to bring up a broader qu a question for you before we hand over to the question period from the participants who are listening to us. And the question that it begs this, uh, uh, this ex ex exhibition and how you're addressing is the issues that how can or how should we relate so, uh, to uh, nature? Uh, how, yeah, what should, how are you looking at our relation to nature? With this goal? Question, it's, you know, something, you know, um, that might take many years to, <laughs> you know, fully realize. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm posing a lot of these questions myself that I'm, you know, myself kind of, as you know, as I said, kind of working through thinking of, but, um, you know, all three of the works in this exhibition um, make reference to our web of relationships with nature and, and industrialization in some way. And, you know, they speak to how we use technologies to control nature in order to kind of satisfy, um, you know, some of our more powerful um, needs. Um, and, um, you know, this desire, um, you know, is a reminder of also how easily um, the wisdom of the land and its history uh, has been disregarded. Um, so, you know, those, those are some things I'm kind of I, you know, I, I think about, you know, as I was kind of making, making the works and, um, you know, for example, um, for the, for the video piece, you know, this might, um, you know, kind of tell the impact that our cities and, and urban environments have had on birds habitat and, and migration routes. Um, uh, in the sculptural piece, you'll see that I use, you know, this two headed crow um, atop the bell jar and, you know, this one, one way you could look at this is it signifies, you know, nature kind of wrestling back um, control of itself, um, but also this unusual, you know, kind of form of the bird might kind of indicate our impact of industrialization on the natural world. Um, but it shows us that life, you know, finds its way to carry on, um, you know, despite our best efforts uh, to get in its way. Um, uh, you know, and, and also like in the photograph, things that, you know, I was kind of thinking of, um, you know, we, I, I kind of, the image presents this character, um, you know, with this, this kind of strong need um, to connect with, with nature and with history. Um, you know, it's sheltered by an environment that at the same time is kind of feeding this need for control and, and connection. And so, um, you know, I think, you know, I don't, 
know if that completely answers it, but those, you know, those are some things I was thinking that maybe people could kind of take from the works and maybe, um, yeah, and think about, you know, uh, in terms of their relationship um, as well. So with nature, so. That actually answers a number of uh, questions that are coming through the uh, the chat line, and what because one of the question uh, uh, that is being asked is how are you seeing the evolution of your work? Are there, uh, mm -hmm. What crosses your mind when you start working on a project, and where are you going? So this concern of the environment and our relationship. What can you tell us? Uh, une des questions qui, qui a été soulevée, c'est cette à savoir, dans cette perspective de, de l'avenir, qu'est-ce qui préoccupe Meryl quand elle est en train de créer, et si on peut parler d'évolution, où est-ce qu'elle s'en va avec ses, ses projets, Meryl? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think, uh, I'm always, I mean, within my work, I'm always interested, um, you know, uh, about, you know, I'm exploring things that I'm, I, I'm reading or listening to around me, um, questions that myself, I, I don't know how to answer, or I'm trying to answer. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so my, in my evolution in my work, you know, I, I don't know, I don't, you know, know how, um, I think like most artists, potentially, like, uh, it's hard to know how, you know, I don't know my next body of work yet, like what that will be or what that will look like. Um, I think that uh, opportunities like this um, are interesting for myself and, and I'm sure they're artists because it kind of gets you out of your comfort zone um, of maybe, you know, dialogues that you're, you're, you're always exploring potentially like or, or, or ways of working. And um, so I think that um, I was a bit hesitant at first, you know, to, to take on this opportunity um, uh, uh, just because of it, you know, I don't know what I'm gonna do uh, looking through a museum collection and I don't usually do that. That's not, you know, my usual process. Um, so I think that, I mean, you find your way eventually and, and, and then you do it in your own way and your own voice. Um, um, but I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, I think this opportunity giving me the chance to uh, break out of my comfort zone because it was a smaller exhibition and try to experiment with video and sound and, you know, sculpture in a different way. Um, you know, I think that, um, yeah, well, definitely in some ways, um, you know, uh, kind of um, carry forward potentially into other projects that I do. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, um, you know, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure, you know, how, um, you know, I will, how my work will progress. Um, you know, as I said, I'll, I think I'll still work with, um, you know, yeah, yeah, looking at, yeah, I mean, I'm, yeah, with my work, I mean, I look like at the present day, the present moment, but then I also look to the past and, and look to the future. So I think in some way that's a very broad spectrum of ideas, but like, um, or concept, but I mean, I think I'll, my headspace will always be in that kind of vein and whether that's exploring myself or whether exploring, you know, um, you know, this, this concept of the environment and nature and, um, uh, you know, it, it uh, um, who knows? So well, yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> well, I'll thank uh, Vicky for having asked that question. And yeah. in these brother questions that are coming in, there's a very interesting question from Akil. And I think would like to know uh, how, what, what, what did you think about the collaboration with the museum that is entrenched in uh, looking at history? And what do you expect or wish from cultural uh, institution for the future? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, might like another day to prepare for that question. Um, uh, no, so I mean it. Um, yeah, it, as I said, it was it was a very interesting um, you know experience uh, getting invited to to explore a museum's collection. Um, you know, I'd never never done that before. Um, and um, oh yeah, sorry. What was the first part of the question? My mind's just. <laughs> 
Um, With a baby, I'm just not, my memory these days is horrible. <laughs> it's not really the relation, your relationship with a museum yeah. that deals with history, like the oh. and the well, Yeah, I mean, I, I um, again, like, I think it's an interesting challenge, um, you know, for, for, for any artist, but, you know, I do in my own work, talk about, um, you know, complicated and troubled histories um, um, when it comes to my own heritage, um, um, being a mixed, um, you know, um, a Plains Cree and then European heritage. I, I deal with a lot of those kind of questionings of those histories um, uh, in, in, in my work. But, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, I, I, um, you know, I wanted to, um, yeah, look at uh, the collections in a different way. And again, like I, you know, posing these questions back to myself, back to the museum, possibly, you know, um, you know, having them explore these themes as well. Um, you know, um, maybe that makes them think differently in different ways, the curators who I've worked with and, and all that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, um, I think it's just an opportunity. It's a challenge and it's an opportunity to, um, to uh, bring forward again, maybe um, different histories that people um, wouldn't normally see that might not be on display, um, you know, in the usual permanent collections that are going through. It's just a chance for, for kind of, um, yeah, fresh perspectives to be brought in. Um, to the collections than, than from maybe the people who are seeing them, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, um, so I think that, yeah, I think that it, it, it's a very interesting and, and good opportunity that, that museums, um, you know, like this are, are in, you know, doing, inviting artists in and, and having them um, yeah, uh, um, um, explore and comment on, on the collection. So yeah, that's my feelings about it. Merci beaucoup. Uh, uh, I know that uh, the clock is ticking and I should give the last word to Suzanne, in, but I'm going to still take one more question that I'm going to, uh, that uh, we've been asked and that is quite intriguing. And it's related to where do you find these books? What can you tell us about these books that you're using in the show? Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it's, um, not much of a long story, but um, so the, the the guy that I worked with, um, uh, Kevin, so he he was the one who sourced the birds and um, he does a lot of work with the ROM actually. Um, but they're, um, you know, birds, so we get some from the ROM and um, a lot of these birds are donated because they were found as, um, you know, they hit a window and, 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 uh, and died or, um, yeah, through, through natural causes, basically, um, uh, the birds are then donated and then he, yeah, sources them that way. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so, um, yeah, they're, you know, um, well, I wish I could say no, no birds were harmed in the making of this. So, but, you know, like they, they, uh, um, they died of um, um, natural or kind of unnatural causes of, you know, um, you know, going into a building or, or whatnot or, um, you know, hitting a car or something. But, um, but yeah, they weren't killed specifically for this project. Um, oh, and, yeah. But there is a bird with two heads in it. So, so yeah. I know I'm going to not reveal everything and let the visitor experience and discover. And I know that we'll have other occasion through the table ronde to have maybe other opportunities to ask you uh, other questions. But for me, I'd like to end on this one and really invite because like, yeah, just seeing these, uh, uh, these images and actually experience the, the work physically is a very different experience. So I feel very honored though, to have been mm -hmm. asked for 
to be a moderator and I'd like to thank you. And uh, je voudrais aussi remercier, je n'ai pas été très bon à résumer en français toutes les interventions, mais je crois qu'il euh, y avait vraiment beaucoup de, de matière et que vous allez avoir d'autres occasions aussi pour discuter euh, avec euh, Meryl et avec les euh, conservateurs du musée. Alors, je voudrais ré remercier infiniment Guylaine et Aïlène qui est très chanceuse d'être euh, sur place. Alors, merci beaucoup. Suzanne, à toi la parole. Well, thank you, Meryl, for this great conversation with you. And thank you, Hélène. Thank you, Guylaine. Thank you, Pierre-François. Uh, and uh, I'll just take two minutes to conclude this meeting to uh, thank our partners here, La Presse, uh, la, la Gazette, uh, Le Conseil des Arts de l'Ontario, Le Conseil des Arts de Montréal et le Gouvernement du Québec. Et après avoir entendu de par de parler de cette exposition, je suis certaine que vous avez envie de venir. Alors, euh, nous vous offrons une visite très sécuritaire. Ne vous inquiétez pas, on a mis en place toutes les mesures euh, sanitaires qui sont exigées et on vous demande de réserver, bien sûr, vos billets sur le site Web. Et euh, vous irez consulter notre site aussi parce qu'il y aura une table ronde, justement, euh, le 2 juin de la nature sous silence, la taxidermie du vivant et euh, vous trouverez tous les détails sur le site. Et en terminant, je veux remercier l'équipe du musée qui a fait un travail comme d'habitude formidable. Merci à Hélène, merci à Guylaine, Hélène Sanson, Guylaine Demé, François Valley qui était chargé de projet, qui a tout coordonné, qui a fait un excellent boulot et nos techniciens, encore une fois, qui ont été... Euh, remarquable. Alors, merci à tout le monde. Merci aux gens qui ont participé aujourd'hui à ce vernissage et au plaisir de vous voir au musée. Venez voir l'exposition, c'est magnifique. Alors, bon week-end de Pâques à tout le monde et à bientôt.